Lord, we just thank you for the power of your presence here with us this morning. Lord, reaching through every vehicle, reaching through every broadcast, all through the airways, Lord God. Lord, that right now you're touching people. And Lord, we just stand and we pray for people this morning. We stand and we in agreement and pray for people this morning, Lord. We agree that what Romans 8, 31 tells us, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It is written, for your name's sake we are killed all day long and are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. So Lord, we praise you this morning that you love us, you intercede for us. And Lord, I just declare right now that every person out there that's fighting sickness, whether it's sickness attached to the coronavirus or it's sickness, Lord God, that's just in their bodies, Lord, we pray for the prayer request that came in this morning from Monica. We just declare, Lord God, that right now, every sick person is healed in Jesus' name. That, Lord, your power of your presence goes into the room, goes into every person, begins to touch them right now. From the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Begins to heal them and drive out sickness in their bodies. Whatever it's called, whatever it's named, it doesn't make any difference. It has to bow its name to the presence of Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you right now for touching them, for blessing them, for healing them. Lord, we also stand in the gap for every person this morning that's in fear. Lord, we rebuke fear in the, G in the name of Jesus. We tell you, fear, you have no place in the lives of the believers. Because, God, you didn't create us with the spirit of fear. But you created us with a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And so I rebuke the spirit of fear this morning in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord. Faith rises in people's hearts all over this land right now. That, Lord God, that right now people begin to see the truth. That, God, you are in control. You are powerful and that you can move in their lives if we will just believe in you. And they grab hold of faith. And Lord, you begin to move in their lives right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we speak over poverty in Jesus' name. Lord, people that have lost jobs, people that are looking for jobs, people that are hurting for money, I declare right now, Lord God, you are the God who provides all our needs. And that, Lord, you begin to make a way where there seems to be no way. You begin to create things from the north, the south, the east, and the west and bring them in into their lives. Lord, creating, whoo, Lord, just creating opportunities. Creating blessings for them. Creating, Lord God, the ability to reach out and to earn income. So, Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you that they're blessed in Jesus' name. That they are blessed in Jesus' name. Everyone just declare, I'm blessed in Jesus' name. Just declare the good hand of God is upon my life, and I am blessed in Jesus' name. I am blessed, I am blessed, I am blessed, I am blessed. Oh, we praise you for it, Lord. Just worship Him there and just thank Him for it. Just thank Him for His blessings on your life. Thank Him for healing your body. Begin to confess it out of your mouth right now and say, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. Declare it. Say, I'm healed in the name of Jesus. I am healed in the name of Jesus. I'm protected in the name of Jesus. I'm blessed in the name of Jesus. Just begin to confess it out of your mouth wherever you are right now. And just let the power of God come in there and begin to touch you and fill you. 
to bless you and heal you. Because that's the truth. In the name of Jesus, you're blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed. And Lord, we praise you for it. Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Now there again, just lift your heart or lift your hands to heaven and say, thank you, Lord, that you're my source, you're my healer. You're the one that brings victory into my life. And Lord, we give you praise today. We give you praise. Well, praise the Lord. I know the, I know the power and the presence of God is there with you. I know that he's touching your hearts here this morning. Our parking lot's full out there. Everybody looks like they're having a tailgate party out there. Got their music turned up. They're all sitting in their trucks, cars, motorcycles, everything in the world out there this morning because people are hungry for the power and the presence of God. And I'm so glad you tuned in with us this morning. And I know that, you know, if this is your first time you've ever been with us, first time you've ever watched uh, our live feed, well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you're with us this morning. If you're a regular church person, and you'd be here all the time, well, I'm sorry you're not here. I'm looking again at empty seats in our church, but I'm just believing God and seeing your faces in my heart. I know that, that these are you know, difficult times for us, but I know that we're going to get through it. And I just am so encouraged that y'all are listening and that y'all are watching, sending me texts and emails and letting me know what God's doing in your lives. Listen, don't get discouraged. Don't be dismayed at all the things going on in the world right now. We as Christians, we're going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. We're going to keep going on. We're not going to stop. We're not going to be hindered. We're going to just go on and just watch how God is going to bless us and pull things off. Man, I'm telling you, God's going to pull things off like you have never seen if you'll just have faith and trust in him. Now, a couple of things I want to tell you. Uh, I guess this is the announcement sec section of the service. I, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> it's kind of weird talking to this TV out here, looking at a camera out there, not seeing anybody, but I'm telling y'all, this is the announcement part. I'm not, I'm not going to back off coming up to Easter service. I have uh, been praying about it, been praying about it, and, and you know, two weeks is going to be our Easter service. We are going to celebrate the presence of Jesus. We are going to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. We may have to do it like this. You may be celebrating your own home, the people out in the parking lots, but we're going to have a communion service that day. Now, this is a little difficult for me to try to figure all this out. So you got two weeks, all of you that are going to be in your homes, you've got two weeks to get prepared. And what I want to ask you to do is for you to get some bread and get some juice Get some whatever, whatever you want in your house there because you're going to have to take communion there in your house. But I'm going to, we're going to have it all together. We're going to basically be all together having communion, you in your house, those in the, in the parking lot, in the parking lot, and we're going to have communion. So you need to be prepared and get you some, some bread and some elements that you can, you can drink with your family. And uh, we have purchased the little individual communion cups that has the wafer on it that are all sealed, and we're going to have those put into a, a sterilized bag, and then I'm going to be able to hand those to you for those that are actually out in the parking lot come by. I haven't quite got all that stuff figured out yet, but just show up. If you're in your vehicle, you will be, have the ability to have the communion elements given to you there like I said, in a sterilized little bag. And if you're at home, well, then however you choose to have communion there, you can have it. You know, so many times we get caught up on, on the, uh, the form of things. And I've heard testimonies before about servicemen going into battle and taking communion with malaria pills and water in their canteen and seeing God do amazing things. So we're not going to get technical on what kind of bread and what kind of juice you got, but I just tell you, get something there prepared in your house because in two weeks we will be having communion via the broadcast to each and every person. So in preparing to go to that, amen, got some honks in the parking lot going on this morning. So the next three weeks, today, next week is Palm Sunday, and the following week will be Easter Sunday. 
And I feel like the Lord gave me a message for the next three weeks. And so I'm going to start preaching this one this morning. And I'm leading up to Easter service. So it's going to be really important you listen to all three messages, get them all down because one's feeding into the next and the revelation's carrying through. So you're going to want to, you're going to, want to hear all three broadcast. But um, so I want to start today, uh, the first one, uh, and I'm just simply calling it the fall, the fall. And I want you to go to Mark chapter 2, verse 1. So get your Bibles out. Go to Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And it's a story here. I'm just going to read it. It says, and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. Now, when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, put yourself in this place. The, the, the house they were meeting in is so crowded, it's completely full. There's no place to get a paralyzed man who's laying on a bed being carried by four men into the room. It's too full. And so these, these, these guys, you know, I mean, it sounds wild to me, but they come up with this idea that they're going to tear off the roof. They're going to they're gonna let this man down. So, I mean... You know, they had to have some tools or something to tear the roof off with. They had to get some ropes to let this guy down through the ceiling with. You know, I've always said, because I've, I've taught on this message before, but I've always said the poor guy whose house it was is watching his roof get tore off. He's got anxiety and anger over that. And so they go through this whole situation. They're tearing it all off. The faith that the man, the, par the paralyzed man must have had to trust his friends to tie four good knots. And, and, and then to be able to let him down equally, you know, somebody didn't get ahead and get him t tilting over to one side or the other, you know, and to, to roll him off the bed. You know what I mean? It, to me, it looked like a catastrophe just waiting to happen. But these guys accomplished it. They got it, and they're bringing the guy down. He's descending down through the house. He's coming down, and Jesus, it says, saw their faith. So that means faith. You can see it. It has a, a tangibility to it. When someone's in faith and you look at them, you know it just like you know when you look at somebody and you know they're scared or they're afraid. It's exactly the opposite. And so Jesus saw their faith and he says to them, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, how does that line up with the way we are as Christians today praying for a sick person? That's not anything that we would come up with. That's not any kind of a thought that we would have to pray for a sick person. We'd be praying something like, in the name of Jesus, Lord, strength come into his body. We'd be praying something different. And Jesus simply said, son, your sins are forgiven. And if you read on in the story, it says, and some of the scribes are sitting there. They reason in their heart, why does this man speak blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately Jesus perceived in their spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves. And he said to them, why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say arise in your bed and walk. So Jesus, he put this into he, the way I, I want you to get into the thoughts of Jesus this morning. Jesus is simply saying, it's the same issue. The man being healed and his sins being forgiven, it's the same issue. He said, look, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or arise from your bed and walk. In other words, it's saying the same thing. That's what I want you to see this morning. Jesus is saying, it doesn't make any difference. It's saying the same thing. It's getting the same results. It's going to happen no matter what. Because Jesus is seeing that the problem with the man being healed 
is not that his body is physically damaged, but that he is separated from the power and the presence of God, which he needs that will heal him. I said last week, I think it was Wednesday night, in Ezekiel 47, it says that coming from the throne room of God, there's a river flowing under the throne, flows out from underneath the altar and goes out. And that flow is healing. That's what it says. The flow of that river is healing. So we get this, we get our minds so messed up because we're looking at God. I even saw an article saying God is the one behind the coronavirus. Let me tell you something. God is not the one who orchestrated is behind the coronavirus hurting people. God is a God of healing. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of love. He is not trying to kill people, cause pneumonia, cause them to all this, this, these issues and kill them. That is not God. That is a result of the curse in this world. Amen? Give me some honks. There you go. Praise God. I love that. Okay, so the result, Jesus says, of this man being paralyzed is a result of the curse on the world, the curse in this world. So that's where I want to focus this this morning. I want to talk about what, what happened. I want us to look and really think about Our minds go to, and I just got to say it again, our minds go to the place where when we say sin, everybody freaks out. Everybody goes and starts talking about, oh, sin, oh, gosh, you know, I shouldn't have said this or I shouldn't have done that or or this or that or the other. But you got to look at sin as the big picture. The whole big picture is what I want you to see this morning. So let's look at it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The fall in the garden. It says, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he's lying right there. The devil is taking truth because God said, don't eat from the one tree. And now he's trying to twist it. He's still doing it today. He wants to take an element of truth and then twist it. That's what he always wants to do. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat, nor shall you touch at least you die. So she corrected him. So then he comes back. Then the serpent said to the woman, oh, you'll not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he told her again a piece of truth. He said, oh, you're not going to die. And I, I mean, I don't know what was in Eve's mind right then, but when he said, you're not going to die, you know, he got her to thinking in her physical body drop dead because they were living in the presence of God and the power of God. And she knew she was an eternal being. So I guess in her mind, she couldn't conceive die. But the devil tricked her. And he said, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise. She took its fruit and she ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and he said, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because as I was naked and I hid myself. Now look at this. The death that happened to Adam and Eve at that moment was not physical death. Their bodies did not drop dead. But the death that happened at that moment was the separation from the power and the presence of God. Every day, God walked with them in the the garden. Every day, God's power and his presence came into the garden. He walked with them and he talked with them in there. I mean, we're talking about God, folks. We're talking about Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth and all therein, the God who's in charge of everything. Walked with Adam and Eve and talked with them. They were blessed to be in his presence. They were like, it was like heaven on earth. They were there in the presence of God. But then because of sin, which sin being disobeying what God said, there was a separation. 
Now they're afraid of the presence of God. They're afraid of God's voice. They're afraid of his power. They're afraid and they're drawing back because they said, oh, don't, don't come near us, God, because you can see that we're naked. In other words, we're vulnerable. Everything is exposed. Wow. They didn't want God to see their faults. You see, church, this is the curse that came upon the earth. The curse that came upon the earth is a separation between God and man. That's the death that came on this earth. And since that day, since that moment that took place right there, God has been trying to rebuild and make a way where man can be back in the presence of God. Not just when we die and go to heaven, but here on this earth. He's trying to restore the relationship that the devil ripped away from God. Now. What I love about God is he is so cool, he automatically had a plan right off the bat. If you look down in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, God already has an answer for what happened to the fall of man. It says, so that the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed from all, more than all the cattle and more than all the, every beast on the field. On your belly you shall go, you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And if you notice that word seed there is capitalized. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Right there, it, it's kind of, you know, like maybe you could miss it. It looks maybe a little obscure. But if you see what's happening, God already gave a promise of Jesus coming into this world. That Jesus was going to be crucified. He was going to be bruised on the heel and be crucified. But yet, he was going to rise from the dead and defeat and destroy the works of the devil here on this earth. Woo! Now, if you don't like my interpretation, let me let Paul interpret it for you. In Romans 16, 20, Paul says, And the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So Paul quoted that. He was referring back to the original separation of man in the garden from the presence of God. So God has been working. He's been working and working and working. And these messages, as I go into next week, I'm going to show you how Jesus is the king and he is the Messiah. And then the third week, we're going to be looking at the resurrection. But this week, I want to keep focusing on the curse, okay? So now man's stuck under the curse because of what Adam and Eve did. They're stuck under the ways of this world. We live in a world that is not perfect. We live in a world that is fallen. It is not the way it's supposed to be. We live in the world where the enemy is still lying and deceiving and tricking people. Okay? Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Let me show you something here about what it means to live under the curse. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins. So that's where we were. We were dead in trespasses and sin. Not physically dead, but dead to the power and the presence of God. Separated. Not able to function. Like having, having two wires that are, that are supposed to be connected together, running a current through it, but something is broken. It's not flowing power. And you he made alive who was dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, desiring, fulfilling the desire of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love for which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. So Paul says here to the church at Ephesus, he says, look, when, before you came to know Jesus, there was, you were separated. And that separation 
What it's like is, or what happens is, is you basically were just given over to the things of this world. You were given over to the lust of the, this, this world. You were given over to the power of the devil. You were given over to everything that was going on. He said, but now, man, through the grace of God, we can be made alive through Christ Jesus. So this is where I want to go with this message. You may say, oh, yeah, pastor, I know that I've heard that. I understand that. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, that's good. But I want to show you something here. For those of you that, that are Christians, you've given your life to Christ. I want to show you where the devil is still trapping us getting us in doubt and unbelief so that we don't walk in faith. Those of you that may be listening to this broadcast and you're not sure if you are right with God, if, if you have been, the separation has been taken out, well, then you need to be thinking about this message. And at the end of it, I'm going to pray for you because you need to get right with God so that there is nothing between you and him. But no matter who we are or what place we're at, if you live under the curse there's a place on the inside of you because you're, you're a child of God. When I say that, I mean you're an eternal spirit who's living in a body, who's going to live forever. Your choice, heaven or hell. But you're an eternal spirit. When you die, your body goes into the grave, and it's like the Bible says, ashes, ashes, and dust to dust, and you return back to the earth from which you came. But your spirit, man, is going to live forever. It's either going to live forever eternally separated from God, or it's going to live forever in the presence of God. And that void on the inside of us, when we're separated with God, it yearns. It longs and it yearns, but the enemy gets us crazy in our thinking till we don't know what we're longing for, okay? So I got a few here I want to share with you. The first one is, is that we... we When you're living under the curse, you have no hope. In other words, you're always a negative person. You're always going to see everything. The glass is always half empty. You're looking at this. You're looking at, you're reading the statistics on the coronavirus, and you're figuring you're going to get it because you're a negative person. You're looking, you have no hope. You don't see any way that it's ever going to recover. Everything's going to just go to pieces. It's going to go down. It's going to go bad. This is where you have no hope. Ephesians 2 and 11 says, Therefore remember that once Gentiles in the flesh, you were called uncircumcised by what, and by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being alien from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Folks, listen to me, that's a terrible place to be, to not have hope. Hope is what is the, the Bible says is the anchor to our soul. If you don't have hope, you're just living under the curse, and the curse is having an effect upon you. People that don't have hope get sick. People that don't have hope can't get well. People that don't have hope, their lives go downhill because they're expecting it. They're expecting it. If you don't have hope today, Listen to me, I pray by the end of this message you get encouraged and you'll grab hold of some because all you're doing is living under the curse. The second one I want to show you here, it says in Hebrews 2.14, And as much then as the children have partakers of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release, release those who through Fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death brings you into bondage. It's a part of the curse. It's a result of the curse. Think about this. Your eternal spirit on the inside of you knows, it knows that God is real. But if you're separated from God, it's not wanting to die because it doesn't want to be separated forever from the presence of God. So there's a longing on the inside of you to be secure, to be safe. Oh, man, I keep reading articles right now about people running to the bunkers, you know, people trying to get in there and get, you know, buy all these different things and suits and all kinds of stuff to try to keep them from getting the coronavirus. Well, you know, they may have a car wreck driving up there, you know, 
There's no security in any of that. There's a million people a year killed by car wrecks. So you don't know that if you're trying to run from the virus, you may have a car wreck, okay? God forbid. I don't want to see that happen, but I'm just saying there's no security in this world. Listen, there's nothing you can do to make you totally 100% secure. The only thing you can do is know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. But when you live under the curse, the yearning on the inside of you is to be secure, but you're looking in the wrong place. The third one I want to share is Romans 1.30. It says, they were backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. It says haters of God. It amazes me how, how people want to get God out of everything. And the reason why they want to get God out of everything is because they don't want to feel guilty for what they're doing. So they want to get God out of everything, push God away. But then the moment something happens, they say it's God's doing it. Well, man, either God's real and you need to have a relationship with him or there is no God, so you don't have to worry about it. But no matter what, people get angry with God and they're always blaming God for everything. They don't serve him, but if he doesn't do something they want him to do, well, then they're angry with him. Well, that's a result of the curse. It's the same thing as Adam and Eve saying, God, go from us. We don't want you here. We don't want you in our, in, 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 to see us in our nakedness. Go away from us. Well, living under the curse makes you be a God hater. When God's the one that's loving you, he's pouring his love out right now from the throne to you. God is a God of love and a mercy and grace, and he wants to bless you. But the curse gets our mind and our heart messed up. If we live under the curse long enough, and, you know, I mean, come on, folks. We all know it. We've known people in life that have just lived their life in such a way that they've grown more bitter and more angry and more bitter and more angry until they finally become like they're unreachable. You can't talk to them. You can't reason with them. You can't do anything. Why is that? It's because they're living under the curse. They're not living in the power and the presence of God. They're living under the curse. And when you live under the curse, the result of it is you end up being a God hater. Okay, the fourth one here. Isaiah 45, 20. It says, assemble yourself and come and draw near together. You have escaped the nations. They have no knowledge who carried their wood of carved images and prayed to gods that cannot save. The fourth one here is that people begin to look to other little G gods to bring them relief. I mean, there's some crazy things going on in the world today of people trying to, you know, believe that something's going to protect them from the coronavirus or protect them from, you know, whatever's going on in life and, and doing sacrifices to gods and different things to gods that are just, I mean, it's weird. It is strange. But people do this. They invent stuff to look for relief because we want relief. The world's crying out for an answer. They want a living God. Listen to me. Everybody in the world, I believe, wants a living God, wants health, wants protection, wants prosperity, wants blessings in their life. They want to know God Almighty, Jehovah God. They want to know Jesus Christ. Down on the inside of them, they're yearning for it, but they're looking for it in the wrong place. Psalms 135, 14 says, For the Lord will judge his people, and he will have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nation are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouth. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. We even, we, we even, the American people, I mean, look what we do. We'll, we'll spend time and, and listening to, you know, our favorite singers, watching our favorite football team, baseball team, you know, basketball team, whatever. We'll go, we'll spend all of our time doing this. We'll get crazy. We'll do all this kind of stuff. But then talk to somebody about wanting to go serve God or getting God's presence. They're like, ah, oh, you know, why? Because the longing on the inside of them is trying to fill the void but the void can't get filled with anything but the presence of God. Listen to me. Football is not going to fill it. Money, success, it's not going to fill that void. 
Because the yearning on the inside of you has come from the, the same separation that took place in the garden. The yearning to, to, I mean, come on, nobody wants things bad. Nobody wants to, to be hurting for money. Nobody wants their marriage to be bad. Nobody goes down the aisle, I mean, at least I pray you don't, walks down the aisle to get married thinking the whole time one of these days we're going to end up in a fight and I'm going to hate her. I mean, that's just not possible. You're going down there all googly-eyed, and you're thinking about love, and you're thinking about, oh, and you're just wooed, and oh, you're Twitter-pated. That's what it is. And you're just walking down the aisle thinking everything's going to be perfect. Your love, you've got the love of your life. Everybody's going to be great. You're going to go through life. You're going to be healthy. You're going to be blessed. That's what you're thinking because that's what you want. That's what you long for. Nobody wants to live in pain and suffering. Nobody wants to live in heartache. Everybody wants to live in the presence of God. They just don't know it. All because of the fall. It's all what took place in the garden that separated man from the presence of God. So man striving and working and working and working to try to find something to replace that void. Here's number five. Number five is simply that we give ourselves to the desires of the flesh to try to find joy. So what we're trying to find is joy. We give ourselves to the flesh, okay? I, I love this old saying. It says, you know, the flesh will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. That's always what happens when we start living a life in the flesh. Today, I, I believe... This is my opinion that when I look at the world, especially us Americans, we're very selfish. We're very self-centered. Everything is about us. We don't think about other people. We don't think about the results of other people. We're living for the flesh. We're living to satisfy us now. Why? Again, it's that longing down on the inside. That longing down on the inside of the spirit man saying that it needs, but it needs the presence of God, not the flesh. Galatians 5.19, it talks all about the flesh. It talks about uh, the things of the flesh. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, you're looking in the wrong place. You're not going to get into the kingdom of God by the flesh. I've said it several times here, looking for love in all the wrong places. I mean, I don't know if y'all picked up on that old country song, you know. But, you know, that's really what's going on. They, I mean, they wrote a song about it, but you're looking for love in all the wrong places, okay? You're looking for the presence of God through the curse, and you'll never get it. It is the devil's greatest deception upon mankind to get mankind to think they're going to find happiness outside the presence of God. Just like the devil deceived Eve, just like he deceived her and said, no, no, no. He gave her a piece of a truth and said, oh, no, no, you can eat the, you're not supposed to eat any of the trees. No. Oh, you, you're not really going to die. He was deceiving her. He was telling her a little bit of truth. And so what the devil does to us today, while we live under the curse, he gives you a little bit of truth. Oh, go ahead and do that. It won't, it won't hurt. It's okay to do that. Go, do, do, you know, you need to do this, you need to do that. You know, uh, following all, everything wrong to keep you from the presence of God. That's all he wants to do. That's all the devil wants to do is keep you from the presence of God. So there's always a longing on the inside of us. Now, if you'll hear the Spirit of God speaking to you today and realize that that place in your heart, that longing, is for the presence of God and get it directed that direction, well, then I want to tell you something. You're about to be set for the greatest days of your life because the moment you get right with God and you do away with the separation from the curse. Then it's like the garden experience again. 
You now are walking with Almighty God. He now is talking to you. He now is blessing you. He now is, is coming into your life, and he's beginning to say, you know, don't go that away. Watch out. Enemy's going to trip you up over there. He's, he's beginning to talk to you. He's beginning to lead you and guide you. And then your life is satisfied because you have peace. You have joy. You have the grace of God upon you. You don't live in fear. You don't live in dirt. Listen, people can't take advantage of you because you're in the presence of God. Oh, they'll try. But listen to me, they can't win. Because God made you the head and not the tail. He made you equal and joint heir with his son, Jesus. He made you, like I read in Romans 8 a while ago, more than a conqueror, because nothing then can separate you from the love of God. Now, let me show you a couple of more scriptures here. Come on, give me a honk. Amen. Psalms 84.1. How lovely is your tabernacle. O Lord of hosts, my soul longs for, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They shall still be praising you. David said it so perfectly here. He said, my heart and my flesh, they're crying out for the living God. David got it right. He realized that this flesh shouldn't be crying out for fleshly things, but his flesh and his soul should be crying out for the presence of God. And folks, right now, we need to raise up and rise up in this nation. We need to raise up off our sick beds, and we need to raise up off our beds of doubt and unbelief. We need to raise up and start having a heart that's yearning for the presence of God. We need to start getting serious about the presence of God. We need to start making our homes a sanctuary where, they are, where we sit down with our family and we worship and give thanks to God so that his presence in, covers our house. Amen. Another one David said, said it a little bit different, Psalms 42.1. He said, as a deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, O Lord, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When, I shall, when shall I come and appear before God? So David put it in, in a perspective here for us to understand. The longing in your heart to be successful, to be blessed, is only going to come when you turn that longing for God. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that you, you know, automatically have to get a big white bed sheet, a big tambourine, one of them big family Bibles, and stand on the street corner, and, 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 and that's what God's calling you to do? No, folks, listen to me. It's about knowing that God has to be first in your life. It's coming into a realization and an understanding that there was a separation that took place in the garden between you and God, and you don't want that anymore. You want to be one with him. In John 17, Jesus prayed. He said, Lord, let them be one as you and I are one. It's the joining back, the coming back together. What America needs right now is to come back to God, to grab back hold of the things of God, to come into their lives and, and start to yearn and seek God. But I'll be honest with you. Preachers have gotten it so messed up. Preachers have, 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 have taught such bad doctrine. Churches have taught such bad doctrine that people are, are confused. But I want to set the record straight today. Where your faith needs to be is you want to be back in the presence of God. Now listen to me. There's only one way that can happen. God had a way. He said in the very beginning that Jesus and the devil were going to fight it out. And that Jesus was going to be victorious. Next week, I'm going to go into all the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament and all the things about who Jesus was. But I just want to tell you today, the only way the separation can be made right is through the blood sacrifice of what Jesus Christ did for us. God knew that man could not do it. He gave the law of Moses down to the children of Israel and said, here, if you can do all these things, well, then you'll be right. But 
He knew they couldn't do it. There's no way, there's no way we can do it. Live holy before God without the presence and power of His Spirit. You're not going to do it. You can try to do it by works. You're not going to do it. You know, it amazes me. I saw yesterday on the television uh, 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 an ad came up where you can call the California Psychic Line. And for a dollar a minute, they'll give you your own psychic reading. Now, this was on major television. It came up as a major ad on there. It was done professionally. It didn't look hokey. It had all these people on there talking about saying, oh, yes, I couldn't believe the psychic reading they gave me. It was so accurate. It was so this. Normal-looking people of all ages going across there talking about this. But let me tell you something. What they're doing is they're saying they're hungry for truth, but they're looking at it, looking for it in the wrong place. They're looking for it in the wrong place. The place to be is in the presence of Almighty God. The place to be is with a God who walks with you all day long and by the power of His Spirit upon you is there for you. Amen? You're not going to get it on a hotline. You're not going to get it from a psychic. You're going to get it from a relationship with a living God. But you have to, right now, begin to take that longing on the inside of you and get it focused in the right direction. And it's to seek God. Now, Jesus came on this earth. I'll show you next week. He fulfilled all the prophecies of the Old Testament. That the Messiah was coming. That what God had spoke in Genesis 3 was going to come upon this earth. And when he came upon this earth, that he was the perfect sacrifice that he would be the lamb that was slain on the altar without any blemish, whose blood could be poured out upon the mercy seat of God so there could be an atonement for all of mankind. <sighs> Jesus paid the price for you and me. Jesus laid down his life so that we could get out from under the curse. He said, Take my yoke, because my yoke's going to be easy, and my burden's going to be light. The Apostle Paul said in, 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 in Colossians 1.13, he says, he's going to translate you, take you out of the kingdom of darkness, take you out of the curse, and then put you over here in the kingdom of God, the son of his love. See, there, he wants to get you back into that place like the garden was. And he's... He didn't make it hard. He didn't make it complicated. He didn't make it to where we've got to do some kind of works that, that, that we're not going to be able to, you know, to accomplish. He simply said, look, you have to believe in me that I am the Son of God, that I paid the price for you, that I arose from the dead, and I'm seated at the right hand of God. You have to repent and ask me to forgive you of your sins. You see, he did all the work, but it's up to us to take the longing in our heart and focus it towards him. He said, when you do that, you will be saved. Now listen to me, church. Christians are missing it today because they don't understand the redemption that Jesus bought for them. They're still living with one foot in the world of the curse and one foot in the kingdom because they don't believe Jesus saved them from sickness. They don't believe Jesus you know, will, will, will prosper them. They're not having faith in all of what Jesus did. And I'm here today to tell you, Jesus redeemed us from the curse. The curse that came through Genesis 3, the fall of man. He redeemed us to put us back in right relationship with God. Now, if you're in a right relationship with God, really, folks, you got it made because God, your Father, is going to take care of you. God, your Father, is going to bless you. God, the Father, is going to have mercy upon you. He is going to forgive you of your sins, and He wants you to prosper just like we want our sons and our daughters to prosper on this earth. The enemy's still trying to keep you bound because he's got you believing, oh, one day I'll die, and yes, I'll go to heaven. But you're not living in the 
the, the abundance of the promises. Folks, today is the day Christians need to rise up and realize what we have been redeemed from. What the blood of Jesus redeemed us from. He redeemed us from all the power of the enemy. That includes sickness. Romans chapter 10 verse 8 says, But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word of faith which I preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For every one of you out there listening today, listen to me. Jesus is not a million miles off. He's as close as the mention of his name. If today you don't know that you're right with God, today you still feel like you're separated from God, well, then you need to pray with me right now. Because he is as close as the mention of his name. The word's not far off. It's near. It's right in your mouth. And for all of you out there watching at home, all of you that's out there listening in your vehicles, listen to me right now. If you don't know that you're right with God, well, then I want to pray with you. And I want you to speak it out of your mouth at your, right there in your homes and confess it and, say, and repeat this prayer with me and make this your confession. Just say, Jesus, today I come to you. I see the errors of my ways. I repent. I ask you to forgive me. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me, Lord, of my sin. Make me right with you. I don't want to be separated from you. I want to be with you. Thank you, Jesus. For dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Amen. Now, right there, I'm telling you, if you prayed that prayer from your heart, man, the curse is out of your life. You got transferred, transferred and transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. It happened right now. There is no separation. Your mind may say, oh, wait a minute, you know, how could this be? Yeah, it's too good to be true. It's too good to be true. But that's what happened. For all of you out there that are listening to me today, and you're, you're a Christian. You know you're a Christian. You know that Jesus is real to you. You've asked him to come into your life. But listen to me. You're living and letting the devil come in and put fear in your life, doubt and unbelief in your life. You're, letting, you're, letting, you're looking at this world and the curse of this world and thinking it's going to come upon you. Well, I want to pray for you right now. And I simply want you to get off of the fence and quit riding with one foot living in the curse and one foot living in the kingdom. And jump over into the kingdom and start making declarations that you are children of God, that you are blessed, that God is in you. And let the longing in your heart be Focus for his power and his presence in your life. Folks, as Christians, we ought to be the happiest people on this earth. And all I can tell you is that if you're not happy, now listen to this, this is kind of hard to chew. But if you're not happy, it's because you're listening to the lie of the devil, the curse of the world, just like Eve did. And he's trying to deceive you. Because, folks, you got it made. What can separate us from the love of God? What can separate us from the love of God? Are you telling me right now that God can't deal with the coronavirus? Are you telling me right now that God can't protect you? Are you telling me right now that God can't change that circumstance or situation in your life? Are you telling me? Oh, come on, don't tell me. But are you trying to tell me that God can't reach through the problems of life and touch it? I don't believe so, church. My Bible says, there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. So for you out there, you're Christians. Whoo, come on, give me a honk there. You out there that are Christians, that you've been, you've been wrestling with this, and I want to pray for you right now. And I want you to confess this out of your mouth too. Say, I declare that I am a Christian. 
I am born again. I am washed in the blood of Jesus. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. I declare this day that God is with me. His power and his presence are with me. I will not listen to the devil anymore. I will not listen to the curse of this world anymore. But today is a new day in my life. Today I will go forth as a son of God. I will declare the good news of the gospel. I will tell people about how great Jesus is. And I declare that the power and the presence of God is ever living in my life. And Lord, I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, listen to me. I'm so glad you tuned in today. I'm so glad you were with us. All of you honkers out there in the parking lot, God bless you. Thank you for being here. You encouraged me to preach to this empty church. We have ushers in the parking lot. If any of you out there are, have an offering you want to give, our ushers will pick that up. If you're out there at home and you want to send your offerings, your tithes in, we, we can, you can go to the, to the website there and we have uh, just a push button click and you can, you can give through that or you can mail your checks in, whatever, God wants, whatever, whatever God's leading you to do. But listen to me. Hang on to God. Hang on to his power. Hang on to his presence and watch the great things that he's going to do for you. Hey, God bless you, and I'll catch you next week.